I want to be uh, introduce <clears throat> Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley and his former chief of staff, Mike Zamore, to discuss their book, Filibustered, How to Fix the Broken Senate and Save America. In this informative political history, U.S. Senator Merkley, the author of America is Better Than This, and his former chief of staff take aim at the much maligned Senate filibuster dissecting the origins of the legislative procedure by which a single lawmaker can prevent the Senate from voting on a bill, Merkley and Zamora explain the filibuster's evolution over time. It originated in 1841, when Senator John C. Calhoun organized his fellow Democrats in a three-week-long parade of speeches and amendments during floor debate of a bank bill in a blatant attempt to run out the clock before summer adjournment. The cloture vote by which a 60-person supermajority can override a filibuster was established in 1891 to overcome the growing legislative gridlock caused by this stand-and-deliver form of obstructionism from Democrats opposed to African-American voting rights. The non-speaking, no-effort filibuster, originally an effort at reform meant to save time, came about in 1975. Despite initial success, it led to increasing obstruction, spearheaded by the villain of the story, Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Thanks to abuse of a 50-year-old reform intended to make it easier for the Senate to pass legislation, the exceedingly difficult, rare filibuster has morphed, plunging the Senate into dysfunction and threatening the very foundations of our democracy. Now the minority party can simply declare a no-talk filibuster, insisting on a supermajority of 60 votes to pass nearly any bill or a lengthy process to confirm any of the president's nominees, giving themselves veto over the majority's agenda. Wildly popular bills languish, judgeships and administrative posts remain unfilled, but ordinary citizens can't see why, because the obstruction all takes place behind closed doors. Senator Jeff Merkley has served in the U.S. Senate since 2009 and has been a champion of reforming our democracy and a vigorous advocate for tackling inequality and climate change. He has written a number of proposals to restore the talking filibuster and responded to the Gorsuch Supreme Court nomination with the eighth longest speech in Senate history, clocking in at nearly 15 and a half hours. The author of America is Better Than This and Filibustered, he lives in Portland, Oregon. Mike Samore was Senator Jeff Mer Merkley's longtime chief of staff and a 22-year veteran of Capitol Hill. The co-author with Senator Merkley of Filibustered, he is a leading expert on Senate procedure and lives in Washington, D.C. Senator Merkley and Samore will be in conversation with Jonathan Capehart. Jonathan Capehart is a Pulitzer Prize winning associate editor of The Washington Post. Since 2007, he has been an opinion writer at The Post. He was a member of The Post editorial board until 2022. He hosts the weekly Post podcast, Capehart, and the weekly Post live show, First Look. Capehart is also a contributor to the PBS NewsHour. Capehart was deputy editorial page editor of the New York Daily News and served on its editorial board from 1993 to 2000. In 1999, his editorial campaign to save the Apollo Theater earned him and the board the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing. Capehart's MSNBC special, A Promised Land, A Conversation with Barack Obama, was nominated for an Emmy in 2021. His memoir will be published by Grand Central Publishing in January 2025. So please welcome our speakers and our moderators. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Wow, there's so many people here. Um, uh, thank you very much, Claire, for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. And actually, Claire did a really good job of uh, summarizing of summarizing the book. But we're going to fill in. We're going to fill in some of the gaps. And the first thing in order to understand this, um, Senator and 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 Mike, is the code. What is the Senate code, Senator? Well, so the Senate code is a, a description of how the Senate worked when it, when it started. And you had a social contract, 
And if you want to think about how this works, think about how a committee works today. The chair of the committee says, anybody have an amendment? Oh, there's your amendment. Great. Anybody want to comment on this? Okay, we've taken the comments. Uh, it's time to vote on it. And you, and you vote. That, quite simply, was the way the entire Senate uh, worked in the beginning. There were many provisions that reinforced this. You had the ability of the presiding officer to call people to order. You had Jefferson's manual of parliamentary conduct that said nobody should speak superfluously and you should get to the, the point. He was uh, enforcing this as our second vice president presiding over the Senate. Uh, you had the previous question and yet the previous question a motion that allowed you to bring something to a vote was virtually never used because the social contract, the code, was, hey, we know we've got work to do. we got to get it done. we got to get on to the next amendment. There's a lot, of, lot here to accomplish. And so uh, that really was the, the driving force that kept the Senate uh, working well for uh, 100 years. And it sounds to me that that was an honor system people knew how to behave and would behave accordingly. Yes, you know? and this this code actually uh, I saw when I was an intern in 1976. So I was uh, uh, working for a Senator Hatfield during the summer and and the tax reform of that act came up of, of 76 and that bill had 125 votes, all simple majority. Each amendment, an amendment would be proposed by a senator. They could propose anything they, they wanted. It would be debated for half an hour or 45 minutes, and then the uh, bells would ring, and this is a time when you had no cell phone, you had no fax machine, you had no uh, uh, way to communicate, so the bells would ring in the Capitol. The senators would rush in, meet with their staff. In this case, I was the staff for it. I'd describe to Senator Hatfield what it was, uh, and they'd vote. And and then they go on to the next minute, 125 votes, all simple majority, no cloture motions to get to the floor, to get to an amendment for final wrap up. So uh, it's within our lifetimes, we still saw elements of the code. Um, Mike, talk about rule four so, of the code. This is rule four of the code, right? Yeah, well, the code- not, not Jefferson's yeah. thing. So, so the code, as you noted, was unwritten, right? There were, the code was a social contract that these 26 guys, all guys, um, who wrote the Constitution in some cases, agreed upon um, from the first con first Congress because they just they all knew each other, they all respected each other's voices, and they all knew they had a job to do, and so they talked and they amended and then they voted. But the rules, as the senator was saying, were also structured to push the debate along, and so. Rule four in the very first Congress said uh, you can only speak twice on an issue uh, in a given day. And that rule is still in the Senate rules to this day, 220 whatever years counting. So um, it, 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 it gives you an indication of what the initial founders, the people who were the structuring this brand new country thought the Senate should be. It was supposed to be a place where people had their say in a reasonable way, and then they move things along. Because remember, this the Constitution and, and Congress was a response to the crippling dysfunction that they experienced under the Articles of Confederation, which required a two thirds uh, supermajority to pass stuff. And so they knew that from, from experience that supermajorities are a bad idea. They knew that Congress needs to be able to get things done. And the Constitution uh, and Congress and the Senate were part of a plan to allow the federal government to act. Okay, hold up. You just said rule four is still, it's now rule 19. Wait, so why hasn't someone invoked it? So uh, <laughs> actually an interesting thing about rule four uh, is it's virtually never been implemented because essentially in the course of debate, even a long debate, you would have people speak twice to an issue, but then somebody would say, well, I'm, I'm moving to send the bill back to committee. Now you have a new issue. And, and now rule four means you can speak twice again. And upon adjournment, the whole thing refreshes all over again. But the reason that this rule is valuable is because it paints the portrait of how everyone was supposed to have a say, uh, but not a veto, a voice 
but not a veto. And as we think about how to now construct by rule what was done by social contract, rule four, now rule 19, becomes very important. Because if we go to a talking filibuster, which we are advocating uh, for, uh, then we would do a version of the talking filibuster that said you can only speak to the issue of final passage of the bill. Well, now, with no ability to move to uh, suspend the rules or, or, or move to adjourn or move to uh, call for a quorum call or so on and so forth, it means the debate would go night and day as long as 100 senators still wanted to speak twice as long as they desire. So in describing this, a debate could go on for weeks on difficult issues. On, however, more modest issues, that talking filibuster where everyone can speak as long as they want would start on a Thursday night and, and it'd be over by midnight and on Monday morning we'd be voting on the bill. So uh, it, it didn't play much role in our history, but it'd play a significant role if we reform the filibuster. Um, one of my favorite quotes in, the, in your book comes from Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania. He was, he, um, he kept a journal, several journals about his time in the Senate, and he talked smack about a lot of his colleagues. Um, I did not note who he was talking about, but here's what he said about that person. He has words at will, but scatters them the most at random of any man I have ever heard <laughs> pretend to speak. Um, all right, so now that we know, we, we know about the code, we know about rule four and how it's still there, but not really. So now let's talk about the stages of the filibuster. What happened in 1841 um, that made the filibuster, uh, I guess this is the first time it, it emerged uh, in the Senate? Well, so uh, picture the tension between the northern manufacturing economy and the southern a slave agrarian economy. Uh, this is really where the, the filibuster was born. And you had uh, clay of Kentucky who basically wanted to be able to exercise the, the power of nullification. Now nullification was a concept that even Jefferson had supported that said, hey, we're more of a confederation than we are a union. And so if there is a law our state doesn't like, we can nullify it. Well, uh, this proceeded to um, uh, go along, and I said Clay Calhoun. Let me correct. Uh, Calhoun uh, was uh, vice president for for Jackson, and he wrote the Southern Manifesto supporting nullification. And what happened? Well, Jackson, who was a slaveholder himself, said hell no. Uh, and in fact, when South Carolina eventually did pass a nullification law over a tariff battle, a tariff battle that they thought benefited the Northern manufacturing and would hurt the South. Well, uh, essentially, uh, Jackson got to Congress to say, well, we'll go to war against South Carolina, and South Carolina backed down. So nullification died at that point. So now how was the South going to stop civil rights? And the reason that this battle came over the banking bill is the vision of the banking bill was one that the Southerners thought would strengthen the manufacturing economy of the North, and to the disadvantage of the South. So it, again, it had this North-South uh, tension. And uh, so they uh, said, well, if we can't stop it through nullification, let's just give long speeches and make a lot of motions. And let's wrap this effort, which was new strategy, quite the contrary to Jefferson saying no superfluous speeches. They wrapped it in the First Amendment. They wrapped it in freedom of speech. They said any cutoff of debate is, in fact, a path to, um, well, tyranny, a path to tyranny. So they wrapped this obstruction in a very high value, and it completely flipped what Mike was describing. Here the founders, writing the Constitution, said, whatever you do, don't repeat the mistake of the Confederation Congress that has a supermajority requirement, which meant they, they couldn't fund the uh, pensions for, for the Revolutionary War, they couldn't take on uh, Shays' Rebellion. Whatever you do, 
do not require a supermajority. And now you had a mechanism that went exactly opposite. It meant that only if every single senator agreed could you close debate, thereby paralyze it. And because it was such an outrageous abuse, that was the seeds of why it became called a filibuster, because filibuster is a de derivation of freebooter, which means piracy. So it was pirates taking over the Senate. Uh, so there we are in the tension of the North and South, the filibuster is born. The actual word is filibustero, Spanish adaptation of a Dutch word for freebooter, people who seized booty. Um, <laughs> I just I tripped over that several times when I when I read it. Okay, so then Mike, what happened in eighteen in eighteen ninety one? So a lot happens between eighteen forty one and eighteen ninety one if you know your American history. Um, and in eighteen ninety one, uh, the Republicans who had been the you know party of abolition and became the party of Reconstruction. Um, they got back control of the levers of power for the first time since Reconstruction had been sort of abruptly ended in, in um, uh, 1876. So in 1890, you've got re the Republicans who have what many see as their last gasp chance to bring democracy to the former Confederate South because states, because in the South, after Reconstruction ended and federal enforcement went away, there was basically no more uh, black voting. There were no more black representatives or sheriffs. Um, uh, you know, it was it was a um, a you know complete reversal of all of the gains that came in the immediate aftermath of of the Civil War. And that was a problem for the Republicans. Keep talking, Mike. I'll yeah. be right back. Sure thing. That was, was a chance to filibuster. Um, <laughs> so that was a big problem for the black Republicans in the South, obviously. Also a big problem for the Republican Party overall, because as we all know from our red, blue state maps on Election Day, if you can't win big chunks of the country, it really impacts your ability to win the presidency. Um, because of the Electoral College, and it impacts your ability to control the Senate. So Republicans get control of, of Congress back, and the first thing on their agenda, or one of the things on their agenda, was a new civil rights bill that would enshrine the right to vote for Southern, well, for everybody, but in particular for the black citizens of the South who had been disenfranchised. And uh, you will not be surprised to hear that the Southern Democrats who had imposed a white supremacy uh, hegemony over the over the political system down there didn't like that idea very much. So um, you, they dusted off the filibuster that that the uh, Calhoun and the other Southerners a generation earlier, two generations earlier had had created. It had been used, but not extensively in the intervening 50 years. And they used it to go to war with the new Republican majority in the Senate. And uh, this was this was really when the strategy got honed and they proved um, without a question that when the South hangs together, the Southern Democrats in particular in the Senate, when they hang together, they can block any kind of reform. And what's more important about that filibuster um, is that in response, the Republican leadership said, look, this is not acceptable. This is not the way Congress and, and the Senate are supposed to work. We need to be able to get to a final vote. And so they proposed a the first version of what has what later became a cloture rule. And the proposal was we'll be able to have a simple majority motion to end the debate after a reasonable period of time. And what happened to that proposal? It got filibustered. <laughs> so um, that that was the that was the defining moment for both the United States Senate and for civil rights in America for 75 years because the the Southern Democrats proved that when they held together, not only could they block any civil rights laws that they didn't like, they also proved that they could prevent the Senate from reforming itself to ensure that you could actually pass civil rights laws. So it began. It really brought Jim Crow uh, into an institutionalized. Um, 
you know, semi-permanent form for three quarters of a century. Yes, as you write, for the next 75 years, the filibuster of the Lodge Act would be the script that the Senate would return to again and again every time an effort was made to deliver on the Constitution's promises to black Americans. And I ran off to get, I realized I left my copy of the book, which anyone who's seen me do this knows that I, I underline and write in this, but there was a, star, a startling statistic, not statistic, statistic, but numbers in here talking about reconstruction and the um, curtailing of reconstruction. You write, the new brutal reality after reconstruction was reflected in the dramatic drop in black elected office holders. The number of black men in the Alabama legis legislature dropped from 29 in 1874 to just two in 1878. By 19 1879, not a single black member was left in the U.S. House of Representatives. And after Mississippi's second black senator, Senator Blanche Bruce, completed his term in 1881, no other black Southerner would serve in the U.S. Senate for the next 132 years. Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina finally broke the string of white Southern representation by appointing then Congressman Tim Scott to fill a Senate vacancy in 2013. My, how times have changed. <laughs> Okay, so um, so Mike, you 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 carried us through this this current effort. Now, can we before we get into the changes that need to be made, talk about the myth? Because as you write, the Southern senators use their vast institutional power within the Senate to defend the filibuster and white supremacy for decades, but they deployed another critical tool as well a carefully curated myth that the filibuster was inherent to the Senate's design and function. And that seems to me something that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell trots out there every chance he can get. Yeah, ab absolutely. And if we think back to that first version of the, the filibuster when the Democrats said, hey, um, free speech, this is all about free speech. And, but over time, they wanted to reinforce that notion that this tool was irreversible, unapproachable. And so they essentially played on something most Americans were aware of, that the founders had wanted the Senate to be a little more deliberative than that crazy house that's elected every two years. So you have those six-year terms, you have staggered one third being elected every two years. You have the indirect election of senators. And then doesn't it just make sense that the founders wanted a supermajority in the Senate? That was essentially the, the pitch or, or the myth. And I can tell you that I have talked to a number of senators when I came to the Senate that actually believed that the filibuster was part of the original Senate, was part of the founders' vision. And so they did a pretty effective job of airbrushing uh, that measure in, even though it was in direct contradiction to the founders' warning to never require a supermajority. Madison said you'll be flipping the fundamental premise of democracy on its head because the minority will make the decisions rather than the majority. And Hamilton talked about tedious delays and contemptible compromises of the common good and, and so forth. So the founders were clear, but they were very successful in embedding this myth. And then over time, you have the Southern Democrats and the South at that point was only one party. So there were no elections where a Republican overturned the Democrat. So you end up with a group of Southern Democrats who have more seniority than any other folks. So therefore, they control the committees. And by controlling the committees, they could suppress a whole lot of civil rights uh, possibilities. And you have Johnson who would proceed as majority leader when folks would come and say, hey, I'm a newly elected Democrat, what committees can I get? He'd send them over to Richard Russell, who controlled the, the committee within the Democratic caucus. And Richard Russell would say, before we talk about your committees, let's talk about your determination to protect the filibuster. So it became deeply, deeply entrenched. And there's an interesting debate you'll find in the book between a, a senator from Illinois called Paul Douglas, and he comes in in the 1950s, and he decides to challenge Richard 
Russell about the truthfulness of this, and the debate revolves around was the early Senate ever to close debate by simple majority? And the answer, I'll save you reading the whole chapter, <laughs> is yes, and it's an interesting uh, engagement over this motion that was deleted from the rule book of a previous question. That previous question, motion, allowed the Senate to close debate if the code failed. They rarely had to use it because the code was so effective. Aaron Burr says, we never use it, let's take it out of the rules. And Richard Russell proceeds to give this story that the previous question was actually a British strategy used in the House of Commons to delay debate, not to bring a debate to a vote. It turns out uh, that uh, that is absolutely false, but it's a myth he continued to reinforce the, the, the filibuster as a natural part of the Senate. You call it false. It sounds to me like a lie. <laughs> it's just, you know, keeping it real. Well, there's something. So you, anyone who's followed parliamentary debate, normally you have a motion. If it passes, you do what the motion says. You, you go, you adjourn, you, you recess, you send a bill back to committee. And if it fails, you're back where you started. This particular motion, as it evolved in Britain, had two outcomes. If it succeeded, you voted on the bill. If it failed, you took at least one day break. And therefore, Richard Russell had a seed of truth. When he said it was used to delay, he was right, but only if the motion failed. And of the, the many times it was used, hundreds and hundreds of times it was used in the 200 years before the founding of our republic in, in Britain, Two-thirds of the time, it succeeded and it closed debate. One-third of the time, it resulted in a delay of at least a day. But Richard Russell seized on that provision, and we didn't have the internet to check things out back then you know, the same way. And so he, he kind of got away with it. But Paul Douglas tried to call him out on it, which uh, um, I thought I, I, I was kind of one of my heroes for having done the, the, the research and tried to confront the system, uh, but ultimately... Um, Although Paul Douglas was right and Richard Russell was wrong, Richard Russell won because the filibuster stayed entrenched. So let's talk about the cha changes to the Senate rules that, that you're proposing. And let's start with the first one, Mike. Eliminate the filibuster on motions that bring bills to the Senate floor so the Senate is not wasting a week's time debating whether to debate a bill. Yeah. So before before I we speak to that specifically, let's just note that, uh, as Claire mentioned in the intro, today's filibuster is a dramatically different thing that ex than what existed from 1841 until you know into the 1990s really so now today when we read about a filibuster or you hear somebody saying they're filibustering that is a senator send say waving their hand and saying no there's gonna have to be 60 votes on this one and that can be an email that their staff sends to the cloakroom staff um and uh you know and that's about it so Al Franken, when he was a senator, he has this great story about how on a um, Thursday evening, as he was getting ready to leave the chamber, he sees Jim Bunning on the floor. He says, oh, hey, Jim, I'll see you on Monday. And, um, and Bunning says, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be here Monday. That's a cloture vote. What do I need to be here for? And the fact is, like, the cloture vote has become so easy because a 59 to nothing vote in favor of ending debate still loses. And so the minority never has to show up. So Jim Bunning was like, why am I coming back on a Monday for a vote that, you know, me not showing up is the exact same outcome as, as me voting no. So that's the filibuster that we're dealing with today. And that's why it has exploded in, in such extraordinary fashion since uh, the 90s or, uh, or even the early 2000s. So I just think that's an important setup. So the motion to proceed, one of the things that's happened, one of the reasons that the filibuster has, has expanded and expanded and expanded in its use is that the minority has discovered that not only can they block stuff um, when they don't like it, if they all band together, but even on things that are non-controversial, they can chew up lots of time because the cloture process that was created in 1917 to end debate when things were really out of hand very rarely used, not intended to be used very often. And so it was a time consuming process. So getting a vote, getting it to a final up or down vote through cloture requires basically you make a motion, you wait a day, then you have a vote. And then if you get the 60 votes you need, you wait another 30 hours in some cases, it's in some, some instances it's less now. But that's a lot of time. And so now we have the routine deployment of the motion of the filibuster on the motion to proceed, which is just the motion like, should we debate this bill? So 
they're filibustering a debate over whether to debate a bill. And it's insane. But it's the reason is that every day you spend waiting for that motion to uh, that vote on the motion to debate the bill is one less day that the majority has to use for something constructive. And all of this is a part of the like that grinding partisan warfare and gridlock has become a, a key weapon of the minority. I want to add on to this if I can, because it's almost incomprehensible how much the filibuster exploded. In the years between 1917, when the cloture motion was created, and 1964, it, a motion to close debate on a bill was voted on six times. You're talking about once every eight years. Now, more, the motion was made more often than that, but it was made and set there and the bill was resolved before they actually voted on, on cloture. And what happened in 64 and 65 is you have the Civil Rights Bill, you have the Voting Rights Act, and suddenly one unexpected side effect is it kind of cleansed the filibuster of its civil rights taint. And so it started to be used on all kinds of other topics and then it started to expand from just final passage of bills to motions to proceed to bills, to amendments. And then the place where Mitch McConnell really comes in this story is on nominations. And if I can't, can I just throw up a chart here for a minute? Oh, I didn't. I, you have a PowerPoint? I, oh, I, I do not. The charts I don't, over here. I don't have PowerPoint. I have a powerful oh. colleague who will help hold these. For oh, he, he, he has more than one. The, um, I just want to try to capture this explosion. And so this is on policy legislation. And so you had more than six times that a cloture motion was filed, but only six times it was voted on through all these decades. Okay, let's toss that one aside. And then people started to filibuster amendments. Now the superpower of a senator was that you could basically force a debate and vote on anything. Uh, well, that now you have uh, uh, the obstruction of amendments that's led to the filling of the tree. Some of you may know what that means, but it basically means that now it takes unanimous consent to have, have an amendment considered. So we have this explosion on amendments and then nominations. This uh, chart showing for 2010, right here, this decade, this huge, that's the Mitch McConnell bar right there of paralyzing, trying to paralyze the Obama administration by filibustering all the nominations, which led to a reform on nominations. So, um, and then the motions proceed was the last one. Do we have that one? Anyway, motions proceed to the floor as well. So a week debating whether to debate. So I'll take all these together. And the reform in 1975 was because in the previous three years, they'd had about a dozen filibusters per year, and then the immediate year preceding, or a little more than 30. Now we have over, everything is supermajority. Every, you, it's like going, operating the Senate today is like walking in a field of mud up to your calf. And every step is so hard. Every little simple thing takes a week. A week to get a bill to the floor. A week to get the substitute amendment. A week to get another amendment up. A week for final passage if everyone agrees. Which is so destructive of our democracy. Uh, because it means that ordinary issues can never be debated. There is a protection of the powerful in here, if I can slip in that little piece of the conversation. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, you know, you think about how the system is rigged in America, and what you have is this vast difference in, in wealth and income. And the result of that is the, the very wealthy have tools that ordinary people don't have. They have media campaigns, uh, they have lobbyists, they have lawyers, they have regular campaign donations to elect people they want, they have dark money in abundance to smear the people they don't want to get elected, but if all that fails, they just need to get 41 votes in the minority to block reform legislation. Combine that with the fact that senators can no longer get an amendment up to challenge the powerful, and you have a system where the entire cycle of democracy is broken. Because the idea is, is you elect your folks who, who, who argue for the policies you like, they go in, get a majority, they pass those policies and test them. 
that is not the Senate today. You cannot complete that circle, resulting in a huge amount of cynicism, dysfunction, and quite frankly, a system rigged for the powerful. And so, Mike, then let's talk about the, the third Senate, the third change, and that is, and we've talked about it a little bit already, but eliminating um, the no effort filibuster and putting in the reform that you both call the talking filibuster. Talk, <laughs> t- talk about that. Sure thing. So in the old days, right, the filibuster that we all know from Jimmy Stewart uh, in, in the movies is senators would talk for a really long time. And um, and that would be how they would stop the legislation from moving. In reality, that was a part of filibustering, but also filibustering involved a lot of procedural moves and you try to have disappearing quorums where everybody just vanishes so that they can't, the Senate can't um, conduct business and all sorts of things. But it was the burden was on the minority to keep the filibuster going. If they didn't want the vote to happen, they needed to be active and engaged. So as we've talked about now, it's a, you know, you send you have your staff send the email and you're done. That's your that's your whole filibuster. So the idea that that we have talked about in the book is this talking filibuster idea. It's bring back that I that that concept where the, the minority has to work for it, because if the minority has to work for it um, and you have a way of of raising the price, then, you know, hopefully it won't happen as much. But beyond that, the real goal here is to re um, to resurrect the dynamics that existed when the code was in place. We started with the code. We talked about the idea that every senator should have a voice but not a veto. And the, the way the Senate worked then was um, the senators engaged. They did their thing, the legislating, amendments, talking, etc. And then when everybody had had their fill and people just sort of like understood that like the time was right, they would have the vote. Um, we're not going to have senators just do that by agreement anymore. So the idea is to create incentives so that both sides have a an ability to have influence over the process. But at the end of that process, when everybody's had a reasonable chance to offer amendments and talk, there is a simple majority up or down vote as there was for 200 years under the code. And that's the talking filibuster, the idea behind the talking filibuster. So under the talking filibuster, you wind up, you, you have a chance to have a cloture vote, 60 votes. You don't get cloture. That means at least 41 senators are voting to keep debate going. So you go into a real debate. And then the topic on the floor is, do you want to pass this bill or not? Everybody gets their two votes that we talked about before under Rule 19, or two speeches. And, um, and you shut down all those other av- you know, avenues for delay and you have the speeches. And if nobody seeks recognition on the floor of the Senate, the rule for 200 plus years is you have the vote. And so that's what the talking filibuster would bring back. So we've got a a few minutes before we open it up to Q&A. Um, and just so you know, the microphone for questions is right here behind. If you're back there, it's behind this col- column. Uh, you, you can't see it. Um, so please make sure your questions are uh, one questions and two short. And um, um, I don't mean to be rude, but if you launch into a speech, I will be forced to interrupt you and I will be rude doing it. So just for forewarn. Um, so we talked about the, the three uh, Senate rule changes. If this were utopia, how would you get, the, if things worked properly, how would you get these three, these three rule changes through? Well, so under the existing rules, it takes 67 votes to adopt the new rule, two thirds. Or if you do it as a temporary rule, it takes three-fifths or 60 votes. But that's not going to be possible because the minority that doesn't want to have the Senate function is going to filibuster it. All right, so the problem that Mike talked about. So let's turn the clock back to Robert Byrd. Robert Byrd became majority leader in 1977. So here is Robert Byrd, the premier proponent of the filibuster to protect the South's desire to stop civil rights bills, but now he's also the majority leader who has the responsibility to make the Senate function. So it's an interesting conflict. And the Republicans cook up different schemes to paralyze the Senate. For example, refusing to vote, and then they have to explain why they're not going to vote, and then the body has to vote on whether they're going to prove them 
not voting. And then another senator says, well, I'm not going to vote either. And, you know, and so here's Byrd saying, oh my goodness, this is not acceptable. We have to fix this. So Byrd develops this, this template for addressing this situation. It is the template for what we now call the nuclear option, in which Byrd would put forward a point of order and say, hey, the rule is supposed to work like this, actually changing how the rule works. And then the chair would either rule in his favor, which is great for, for him, because even if it's contested, well, he's got the majority. So he has the votes to basically table the appeal. Or maybe the chair rules against him and he challenges the chair and he has the votes to overturn the ruling of the chair. This is the nuclear option. So Byrd, very kind of, uh, in a kind of a twist of fate, as the premier champion of the filibuster to obstruct bills he doesn't want, civil rights bill, becomes the architect of the nuclear option. And so that is one pathway. And that is the pathway through which when, when you saw that uh, Mitch McConnell column of uh, obstruction on nominations, we eventually did a nuclear option to be able to do cloture on nominations by simple majority. The second is called the constitutional option. And that means that repeatedly, vice presidents presiding over the Senate have ruled that the Senate cannot be constrained by previous rules. It has a constitutional right to organize itself. So at the start of every two-year session, by simple majority, you could adopt new rules. And it was an effort uh, to do this by Mondale in 1975 that led to the 1975 reform, although it was completed in traditional fashion as a, as a compromise. So you have two pathways in which, which we could enact uh, a, a reform. So what you're saying is I need to call a majority leader Chuck Schumer and, and put a bug in his ear? Yeah, yeah I'd invite you to do that. <laughs> the, the bottom line is the majority of the Senate can do whatever the majority of the Senate decides it wants to do. They can hide behind the minority and say, oh, it's a filibuster. But if, this, if the majority wants to interpret the rules a certain way, they have the power to do so. Uh, one more question before I really do open it up. To, to questions, although no one is standing at the mic, so uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, so then, what do you say to the argument, and this is a, a Mitch McConnell argument, well, if you do this, basically what he did when you did the nuclear option on executive appointments that weren't Supreme Court to get President Obama's nominees nominees through. He said, well, you know, you're going to rue the day that you did this. And well, Democrats rued the day when they did the nuclear option on Supreme Court justices. So wh what do you, isn't there some validity to the argument, especially on this nuclear option? You, you, you don't want to do that because then all hell's going to break loose when you're not in the majority. Mitch McConnell, uh, I think, has proven that he will do whatever he needs to do if he thinks it's in his interest. So, you know, broke the Supreme Court confirmation process by refusing to even have a vote on Merrick Garland, um, imposed a whole blockade on nominations. Um, and it's all an effort to hijack the Senate. Right. This whole this whole conversation is about whether the majority gets to decide our own fate and whether the people's voices determine the policies. If, you, if the people vote for certain um, leaders and certain politicians and have certain policy preferences, will those show up in the, in the policies that are enacted? And what we've had for the last 30 years is a systematic hijacking of the governmental agenda to enforce minority rule. And yes, I mean, there's no question that if the filibuster were gone, and the reforms that we were interested in or or it was a simple majority cloture uh and republicans had a trifecta that democrats uh like like us would be very unhappy with some of the outcomes there's no question about that but the question i think the bigger question is what if we keep the status quo we are losing our democracy in slow motion right now and yeah we can all imagine the one big fell swoop thing that would happen if there were a majority vote in the senate but right now we've got a, uh, a Congress that is unable to deliver, systematically unable to deliver on the things people want. 
whether it's healthcare and lower drug prices or it's uh, access to the ballot box or, you know, a whole slew of things, name your pet issue. And when that happens over and over and over again, people come to the conclusion that, their poli that the politicians, politicians they elect are either corrupt or incompetent. And when you, you know, we start the book on January 6th of 2021. And we saw a, you know, the, an assault on the Capitol, assault on our democracy, an attempt to overthrow the the elected, the duly elected government of our country, essentially. And that is related to the fact that for 30 years, our Congress cannot deliver on the promises that that its leaders make. And so I think, yes, there are downside risks to um, having to majority rule, but um, that's what it's what democracy is. Um, and and you also um, you you start the preface with January 6, but chapter one starts with uh, Sandy Hook uh, and how the Sandy Hook families swamped Capitol Hill, had the nation behind them, and yet nothing got done. We have 15 minutes for Q and A, and ma'am, you go first. Thank you. Um, if the Supreme Court overrules the Chevron doctrine, uh, which it heard oral argument on last week, uh, resulting in the erosion of administrative agencies' ability to make policy. Would that be an effective impetus for congressional reform? Hmm. I'm gonna let the lawyer in the uh, <laughs> crew here. I think that the that there's a growing pressure on Congress to act. And I think if oh, suddenly the administration is unable to do a lot of the things that we at this point expect it to do or Congress has entrusted it to do because of a of a overturning of Chevron, I think that will add to the pressure. But I think ultimately what we what we are looking at like for congress to reform itself for the senate to reform itself is going to require pressure from the grassroots from below on senators to make change irresistible and i think the most likely source of that is abortion rights right now i mean if i were betting um and i think what we've seen with Do the aftermath of dobbs is the um it, it's a similar dynamic to actually the problem in the senate right which is for years, extremists could take extreme positions knowing that it wasn't actually going to get enacted because of Roe v. Wade. The same thing happens in the Senate every day. People take all these extreme positions, and in the House, actually, because people take extreme positions knowing that these laws are not actually going to get enacted and they're not going to actually have to be held accountable for the results. I think the ultimate uh, solution here is enough pressure, enough you know, voter um, in engagement with members of the Senate to for them to feel the the need to make a change thank you, All right. thank you. Uh, we have 12 minutes and i think four people good evening uh good evening sir so let's say the democratic uh senate majority were to repeal the filibuster and the republicans were to get a trifecta is there a way that uh, democrats could prevent uh, the republicans from passing incredibly extreme legislation, as you just mentioned, abortion. Uh, is there a way that the Democrats in the Senate would be able to do that? And uh, would you be willing, Senator, personally to uh, get rid of the filibuster, knowing that that might happen in the near future? You know, our, our whole book uh, doesn't argue for getting rid of the filibuster for this reason. Instead, it says, let's have a talking filibuster. Now, that talking filibuster means that the minority on issues that they are greatly concerned about can create an enormous delay, a debate that goes on day and night, for perhaps up to six weeks before the American people. American people can weigh in on whether they are heroes or they are bums. Nothing can be done uh, uh, instantly. And the idea here is that it incentivizes compromise because the majority can't afford for the floor to be tied up for six weeks and the minority has a very hard time sustaining debate day and night uh, for day after day after day. It's, it's basically the longest filibuster in our history uh, that went day and night was uh, about a week. Uh, and um, I think it was the six, 1960, wasn't it? The 1960 uh, filibuster debate. And so um, for the very reason you're saying, uh, we think it's much better if the minority does have a voice. That the argument 
is simple. The Senate doesn't want to be the House, where the minority is irrelevant. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Well, first I would like to say I, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for hosting. Uh, my question is, so you said that there's the whole idea of challenging and then voting on whether or not to overrule. This sounds very like naming names, but like who's standing in the way of that? Like I'm assuming the obvious choices, but like I, anyone like that, like, yeah, I, name some names. Yeah. Name. <laughs> Come on. So, name. So can call. Do you want me to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, <laughs> let me take a shot at it. Uh, and uh, if we go back to uh, 2011, uh, Senator Tom Udall and I spearheaded a, a reform uh, effort, uh, and we eventually got got votes on a, a number of proposals, including the, the the talking filibuster, and we had I think 46 votes uh, uh, for it. And um, but where are the reservations about just using the constitutional option, simple majority at the start, and the reservation about it is hmm. Well, if we change the rules by simple majority, what is going to happen when the Republicans are in charge and they're going to change the rules by simple majority? And so there's kind of been an institutional resistance uh, to that. Uh, so it, it actually has never been, it's been used as leverage in, in 1975, but it actually wasn't the pathway through which rules were, were changed. Uh, but Tom Udall would bring up the constitutional option every two years. He tried to make that point and understand that that is a possible pathway. Now, in terms of January of 22, uh, so uh, here we are having gone through a year of trying to pass Senate Bill Number 1, the For the People Act. That was my bill that took on gerrymandering. It protected the ballot box in all kinds of ways, the registration process. It took on dark money with the, the Disclose Act, Sheldon Whitehouse's uh, Disclose Act, so there would be no more uh, different rules for billionaires. You, you and I make a $200 donation to a candidate, and it's disclosed. A billionaire puts in $5 million, $10 million, $50 million to a friend of the candidate. It's not disclosed. It's dark, dark money. So that bill, we worked so hard, we needed 50 votes to go to a talking filibuster. In the end, we got 48. We had two members of our 50-member caucus who voted against going to a talking filibuster and said, we're here defending the filibuster. What were they actually defending? They were defending the... Um, no effort, silent, secret, 41 vote veto. They weren't defending the filibuster at all. And, uh, and had this conversation with them time and time again. But I'll, the argument that um, uh, Joe mentioned made, Joe says, look, I think it's unhealthy for us to change the rules in a partisan fashion. To which my response was, look, you're either going to have partisan Republican state legislatures obstruct the ballot or you're going to have a partisan Democratic majority in the Senate protect the ballot. Better to have a partisan vote protecting the ballot than one obstructing the ballot. I could not convince Joe of that point. Uh, so he, he had that argument. Now, Cinema, uh, she also obstructed, so we're naming names Oh, okay, here. I, I just asked Mike, hey, <laughs> you're gonna name Cinema. the names? And so uh, Kirsten's argument, she said there'll be wild swings of policy from one to another if we proceed to have a talking filibuster. And um, well, look at the state legislatures. You rarely see wild swings. You rarely go from a trifecta of one party to a trifecta of the other party. Plus, you have to get it through a House and a Senate. You have to get it through a committee and then the floor. And you have to get sometimes the policy and the funding. I mean, we have a very status quo design. And then you have to get a presidential uh, vote. So. The other argument she made was that the current system encourages compromise. And I will tell you, I believe exactly the opposite is true. When the minority knows it can obstruct the majority by 41 votes, it's hugely tempting to use. Your base wants you to use it. And this is something Mitch McConnell really brought to the Senate. If we turn the clock back and we look at the House under Gingrich, Gingrich said, we're going to obstruct the majority because we'll have a better case for replacing them. It turned out that was a very smart political move. It was very effective. Mitch McConnell said, boy, 
Gingrich gives obstruction a good name. And in the Senate, there's two tools that Mitch McConnell had that Gingrich didn't have. And one was nominations to eat up a huge amount of time, and the second was the Senate uh, filibuster. So we had two individuals with two arguments. We lay out in the book why we think they were wrong and misguided. And uh, so when you read the book, you can get more details. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, do you want to add anything to that? I'll just say that the the people who are most reluctant to change the Senate see themselves as institutionalists. But you cannot be an institutionalist and defend the status quo. I mean, you saw the charts. Today's Senate bears no resemblance to the Senate that existed for 200 years. So I just, it's a reminder um, of, of, to the folks who want, think that they're protecting tradition, that the tradition that they're protecting is but 30 years old at most. And what we need is a Senate that does the things the Senate did for most of its history, most of the time. There's another key element here, uh, which is that Republicans and Democrats look at this problem very differently. Republicans, proceeded to do a nuclear option, and they did it in 1996. There was a filibuster-free pathway passed in 1974, the Budget Control Act, that was specifically for one reason, reducing the deficit. Republicans in 1996 said, we are so frustrated. We tried to do a line item veto. The court threw it out. We tried, we tried to do a um, uh, constitutional amendment, uh, uh, budget, balanced budget amendment. We didn't have uh, the 67 votes. We only had 66. But you know what? What we want to do now is deliver on tax cuts. Oh, the Democrats are not going to allow us to give away the Treasury to the richest Americans. How are we going to get this done? So they proceeded to have the parliamentarian rule, who had worked for Robert Dole, Robert Dove was his name, have the parliamentarian rule that suddenly this filibuster-free pathway for reducing the deficit could be used to increase the deficit. So Republicans campaign on tax cuts that can affect almost any policy you think about, and they can deliver by simple majority. But when they're in the minority, they can obstruct Democrats who kind of a little bit more wonky on policy, want to do good health care, good housing policy, education policy, climate policy. So from Mitch McConnell's point of view, when he's in the majority, he can enact an agenda. And when he's in the minority, he can obstruct the Democrats. So the Republicans have been uninterested in fixing the Senate because from their point of view, heads they win, tails we lose. Um, and so with, with that, because you guys ping ponged back and forth with your filibustery answers, <laughs> we are unfortunately out of time because I've been told we, we have a hard stop so that there can be time for book signing, and you can ask your questions um, of, of Mike and, and the Senator uh, when you get your book signed. But Senator Merkley, Mike Zaymore, thank you both very Jonathan, much. Thank for you. Being. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Fix the Senate and save America. That's what we have to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you.